We're talking LA Chargers football on the Prime Sports Network YouTube channel. And don't forget, we just uh, finished uh, putting together a very short video that you can find on the Orlads Football Network. We'll have a link in the description. We did the top three draft needs. And Alex Insdorf is our special guest covering the Chargers for the Chargers Wire. And also you can find out about his podcast on YouTube and streaming, of course, on Apple and so forth. Guilty as Charged podcast. And he specifically holds bolt, bolt break th- breakdowns on that channel. So, Alex, good to have you on here for the very first time uh, talking Chargers football. Yeah, excited to get into it. Draft is nine days away, so uh, we'll talk about the depth chart now, and then in nine days, that might be a completely different story. But uh, certainly, certainly a depth chart that uh, is a little bit of an eyesore right now after free yes. agency. But hopefully, we can get it to where it needs to be. Well, let's talk about the uh, wide receiver position first. It's a great way to start uh, because it's the no- top need. Everybody, I think, is there's a consensus on that. Um, and we've done the mock drafts here on the show and I haven't had the opportunity to pick for the chargers on any of our mock drafts. But what I've done is, is I've kind of uh, taken the other side being, and I, we didn't, I didn't even mention this, but being, even though I've got the Rutgers, we probably should see this too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so when you were a Rutgers fan, you grew up in New Jersey back in the sixties, seventies, there's not a lot of Rutgers football on TV. So you yeah. had to, uh, any, anybody uh, had to, uh, even if you were, no matter what kind of fan you were, uh, you had to go for those big programs. And I and I, I went with Michigan. So I grew up when Harbaugh was the quarterback there. So I have a lot of ties to, the, to, to Michigan and to Harbaugh. So I'll be rooting for him, no question, with the Chargers. But I, I also wanted to bring that up because, like I said, I had a point that I, I thought was valid which was, it's obvious, they need a receiver, they're going to be able to draft either the first or second receiver, it's a done deal. I don't know about that. and be, I don't know about that because of two reasons. One, I really believe he's going to trade down. I think the Chargers need some more, because um, you just talked about it, they need a lot more ammunition on that depth chart up and down. Number two, um, I think that just as much as, having a really good receiver, especially in the NFL and Quentin Johnson. Wow. That's what everybody's looking for. And Jim Harbaugh, and he's no different, but I also know that Harbaugh is about building, especially on offense, building the line of scrimmage. Right. Uh, he still needs to have an athletic tight end. He's got a really good uh, uh, blocking tight end, but he needs an athletic pass catching tight end. And, um, and, and, and getting Gus Edwards obviously is the first step in building the power running game, but that's just the first step. So, um, so, my, so the long way to putting it is, is I, I don't know. I think if they don't trade down, I'm still looking at them as possibly drafting a tackle, uh, but that's why I think they'll probably trade down. Um, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a Dunze if Harrison goes before that, or, uh, um, uh, or, or again, it, I know because most people believe of course, uh, that, uh, Harrison will go in the top four, but if he's still available, I think that's the only way that I could see him taking a receiver. If somehow Harrison is still there at five, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I think the position they're in is that they kind of are at the mercy of what the Cardinals decide to do uh, a little bit because the Cardinals are at four. There's been a lot of trade back talk with them, uh, potentially trading back with either teams like the Vikings, Giants, teams that yep. are going to be angling for whoever that fourth quarterback is ever since the combine, there's been that four quarterbacks going in the top four smoke. Um, How much of it is real? You know, we'll find out in about a week or so. Uh, But I do think the chargers, if they had the four spot, uh, I think there would be kind of almost a no brainer that they, Oh, you mean if they moved up to four? No, no, no. I'm saying because there, there was actually a game where the chargers, (laughs) the chargers were, had lost to Kansas city in week, uh, week uh, week 18 and uh, the Cardinals missed a field goal. Basic, basically, you know, uh, I don't want to say it was intentional, but they missed the field goal. <laughs> he but, never misses you know, those. Yeah. 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 Matt Prater misses two field goals, I think, in that game. And then he yeah. misses uh, the one at the buzzer that would have given them the win over Seattle. Chargers would have gotten the fourth. So check his I'm bank account. That, I'm not saying that uh, Jonathan Gannon, Cardinals coach, told him to shank it. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just implying, I'm asking the question. Um, but anyway, I think if they, you know, controlled their own destiny in that sense with, with yeah. the fourth pick, then the situation would be a little bit different. But I obviously, agree. 
they are kind of, like I said, at the mercy of what the Cardinals decide to do. Um, now, if they, if one of the quarterbacks does slide to five and so let's say the Cardinals stick and pick Marvin Harrison Jr., then I think the trade down scenario becomes very likely. Um, but it's just kind of uncertain in the air. Yep. Um, my, my take in terms of what I would do is I think you have to stick and pick the blue chip receiver. Um, I just think when I go back through these last, you know, four drafts that I've covered, uh, on the podcast, I I think Marvin Harrison Jr. and Malik Neighbors, uh, and even Odunze is about as strong as a top three, um, at wide receiver that there's ever been. And, you know, in replacing Keenan Allen, replacing Mike Williams, those guys, I just think you need to have Justin Herbert have, you know, a cost controlled, you know, wide receiver that has the potential to be a top five guy in the league. Uh, and that's really what those players can bring to you over the next four years, uh, five years of their rookie contract with the fifth year option. So um, that Who do you is think you'd be leaning towards a Dunze or neighbors? Na- um, personally, I lean towards the neighbors. Um, and I know the chargers uh, met with him. They had an official top 30 visit with him. They met with Odunze, I think, at the Combine also. Uh, and then Hortiz was at – Joe Hortiz, the GM, was at LSU's Pro Day. So okay. take that for what it's worth in terms of trying to, like, read between the lines and all that stuff. But uh, personally, I lean towards neighbors and just the, you know, ways that he creates um, explosive plays. I think Odunze will be viewed by some to be the more higher floor prospect um, to some extent compared to neighbors. But I also think the ceiling of what neighbors can do in the league – um, with his athletic profile is something that we really haven't, you know, seen in a while uh, in the draft uh, with as complete of a package as, as he can bring maybe since uh, somebody like, you know, Jamar Chase uh, at the top of the draft, certainly kind of, you know, reminiscent of that. Um, Odell Beckham Jr., you know, when he was coming into the draft, that's kind of, those are kind of the players that I think Neighbors is pretty comparable to um, athletically. So, that would be my preference, kind of if Marv is off the board. If Marv is if Marv is on the board, oh yeah, you do, you I I and I could feel that the Chargers would have this thing. We got to trade back. We have to fill the roster. But that's a little bit board, different. Yeah, yeah. If Marv is on the board, I, I think that you run that pick in as fast as you as fast as yeah. you can personally. And of course, um, that could happen if they if if they get the right offer, like you said, for yeah. somebody wants to move up and grab McCarthy, say. Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, really, really depends, in my opinion, on how much smoke there is about the Cardinals trading back, because I think if the Cardinals trade back, that kind of diminishes the offer of what the Chargers could get to then trade back, uh, yep. with, you know, the fourth quarterback kind of being off the board by that point. And then I think they stick and pick. But if they are able to execute, you know, the McCarthy uh, trade back or the May trade back, whoever is on the board at that point then I think you're probably looking at them getting, you know, the Vikings offer, let's say hypothetically of 11 and 23 and a future pick uh, for five or something along those lines. And then you're talking about getting a tackle of 11 and then you're talking about maybe getting uh, a wide receiver or a corner or some, something like that defensive tackle, maybe at uh, 23. So I think there's a lot of options uh, for what they could do there. But again, they're not necessarily in control of their own destiny. Would you also add Brock Bowers into that equation if they trade down? Yeah, I, I think Brock Bowers could be there if they trade down. Trading down to 11 is a little tough for Bowers, though, because I think there is a lot of smoke about him going to the Jets at 10. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm a Jet fan, and mm-hmm. uh, honestly, I'd be shocked. I know why everybody's mm-hmm. saying it because of the way that the board's falling. Yeah. But – the Jets are so – I don't care what they say about – they just added offensive linemen. They're one-year guys. Yeah. They're prone to injury. He's, Joe Douglas will not allow that to happen again, and he's going to draft right. an offensive lineman. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case, and I certainly think you have guys uh, like Kautanu, Latham, Fashanu, who are yep. going to be uh, in that range once you know Joe Alt probably goes off the board at some point, uh, either to the Chargers or to the Titans. So – I wouldn't I – th- I could see them definitely going for offensive linemen. I think Bowers, to me, <laughs> the only reason I think about him particularly to the Jets is that they need, you know, I think weapons as much as possible, like, in this year. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's it's sure. kind of decision time to some extent on, like, Joe Douglas, Robert Sala, Aaron Rodgers, and, you know, this whole um, era that they've been building. You know, who knows 
what Aaron Rodgers decides to do after 24. Mm -hmm. Um, So I I think that that would be the reason that I think Bowers might be the pick there. But, you know, Bowers is there at 11, uh, you know, maybe maybe people being spooked by the positional value tight end in the first round based on maybe how some of those other picks have historically panned out. Um, Then I certainly think that the Chargers could uh, go in that direction. I think they would lean offensive tackle or defensive playmaker. Uh, yeah. Personally, I, I wouldn't write off the you know chance that they could get uh, a premium defensive tackle or a premium uh, corner uh, that's election too. But I, I think they would probably go offensive tackle if they were to like trade back to 11. Yeah, and, and by the way, the Jets are another team that could could very well trade down too if they trade down mm-hmm. a few spots because they don't have a second round draft pick and they could yeah. definitely use uh, a few more premium picks. So. Um, should be real wild, uh, and, and that's what we love about the draft, about all these possible trades that could occur. Um, and so let's – by the way, how many picks do the Chargers have? They have nine. Okay. And it is – they have uh, all their seven picks, and then they have an, uh, the fourth rounder from the Keenan Allen trade, and then they have the seventh rounder that they got as a comp pick. All right. So basically they really only have the, the double four. So Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, again. I mean, it's a good, it's a good amount of picks. Uh, but uh, you know, if 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 they need as many additional uh, picks as uh, I think we agree that they probably will look to get. Yeah. Um, we'll we'll, we'll see. But uh, a lot can happen, and we just went over all those scenarios. Okay. So um, let's now move on to. Uh, we'll stick with offense and talk about that line because we talk about some people will look and they'll see Pipkins. And okay, contract wise, and you know, player he is. Well, all right, he's probably going to be here for another year, um, and he's been serviceable at best. But in reality, uh, this line, what do they need? What do they need to do? Like, let's just t- take a look at the t- 2025 or 2026 offensive line for the Chargers. And Harbaugh has had two off seasons to reshape it. Uh, who's still there? And what spots do you think will have new and improved players? Yeah, I, I think Rashawn, play, Rashawn Slater is certainly the player that to me is still there. Um, I, I think if you are talking about the three like untouchable players in the Chargers organization right now, it's him, it's Derwin James, and it's uh, Justin Herbert. Like To me, if you're talking about retooling this roster, it is around those three players and you have a, a very you know a stud left tackle, you know, you don't uh let go of those guys and i'm sure at some point they'll come to some kind of extension with him um i think the really big question when you look long term two three years in the future kind of like you were saying is uh cory lindsley you know is on this depth chart he's going to you know presumably retire um as as, you know he's had uh, his you know battles with health concerns and and heart issues um they've signed bradley bozeman from uh, carolina who right now is the presumptive starter um Bozeman is also 30 and coming off of, you know, from a pass protection standpoint, one of his worst seasons, um, you know, he had a lot of 32 pressures last year, I think, at the center position. Um, so I think really, and you even go back to the 2023 Chargers, like the season really fell apart when Corey Lindsley went down uh, in, in week four and didn't play another snap for the rest of the year. You look at the numbers of the Kellen Moore offense, uh, before Corey Lindsley got hurt and after, you know, uh, his, his removal from the lineup, it, it, they're really, you know, jarring uh, from the first three weeks to what the rest of the season was. And I think that was part of the reason the running game fell apart after they had uh, a couple good weeks to start the season. So I think in terms of, you know, Harbaugh establishing the trenches, I, I think the first, you know, domino to fall there is honestly who's going to be kind of the long-term center okay. in this draft. They've given themselves, you know, uh, with the signing of Bozeman, some, you know, room to see, okay, which guy do we like? Who who is, you know, in the draft for sure. Drake Nugent is another Michigan player who would be available uh, potentially in the later rounds uh, there at at center. But um, yeah, to me, I think the conversation all starts there at center. And then uh, the second thing I would say is Zion Johnson and and Jamari Salyer, um, because those were two players that I think the previous regime last year when they switch positions uh jamari kicked out from tackle he went inside after slater was healthy again uh zion essentially flipped sides of the line as well i think they had a a better feeling about that that you know in the preseason with Corey lindsley healthy um 
you know, so what positions those guys are playing, I, I think, in 2024 is very up in the air. Do, do you uh, think that they're, they're quality guards that have a potential future here? Do you think that they might get lucky enough where Johnson and Salyer could be part of the future at guard? I, I think they can. I mean, Salier has shown, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, bona fides, particularly a tackle when he filled in yeah. uh, for Rashawn Slater when he was healthy. Um, last year wasn't as good for him, but he was still certainly serviceable. Zion had a very promising rookie year. Uh, and then last year following Corey Lindsley, you know, it all kind of fell apart in terms sure. of, you know, pressures he was giving up. But he's still a former first round pick. And yep. I think we've just seen the trend around the league that like, teams when someone does have that first round you know kind of bona fide grade so to speak they you know give them a bunch of chances to oh, yeah. get back to where they were uh and so i think zion is one of those guys that you know is due for you know a bounce back as well and uh mcfadden and so did, what do you and again we have to all look at this as this harbaugh but it's also you know there's a new gm so there's really two new uh, faces to the franchise regarding what kind of prospects and players they're going to want. They did not draft these guys. So it'll be interesting to see who they like and who they don't. But what about McFadden? Um, yeah. McFadden, McFadden showing up last year. Uh, he, he played in a couple games towards the end of the season because the offensive line was banged up. So he, he had got a couple snaps towards the end of the year. Um, Harbaugh actually mentioned him, I think, in one of his uh, press conferences as a guy who could potentially, uh, you know, kick into center and be versatile oh. uh, as like a sort of because uh, he actually played uh, some he's played tackle. He's played guard. Uh, and so he's a guy that could potentially be a center candidate. And Harbaugh specifically talked about his versatility. I don't think okay. he would be like a starting center this sure. year, but that's kind of one of those like down the road things potentially, um, you know, how much of that is real versus Harbaugh complimenting everybody on the roster. I don't know. Okay. Um, but that's the first time we really heard <laughs> name potentially mentioned uh, as, you know, center candidate, uh, which is something I didn't really expect to hear. So that kind of depends on, again, what they do in the draft. Um, but if they value his versatility that much, yeah, I can certainly see him uh, playing a role. So, if everything were to go uh, best case scenario, it is possible that, all right, definitely need to find a future center and a future right tackle at the very mm -hmm. least. Those are the two spots that if they can fill those in with really good players, we know Slater's yeah. a good player, then you know what? Maybe the offensive line could be looking pretty good within a year or two. But again, that's if Zion Johnson and Sawyer were to work out. Um, would you agree with that center and right tackle? Yeah, I, I think those are certainly the natural needs coming into this draft. Um, I, I think if the value is right um, in, in this class, I wouldn't be surprised if they looked at, uh, you know, filling right guard and left guard as well, uh, and just getting, you know, bodies in that trench. Or depth, kind of yep. You know, later on day three, Absolutely. that kind of a thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say center and right tackle, uh, depending on uh, the kind of prospect that they're able to get, because I think, the Trey Pipkins watch to some extent really is the first round uh, in terms of are they going to get a Joe Alt, a Troy Fautanu, a JC Latham, somebody yeah. who they would put at right tackle year one or because you know, once you get to round two and let's say hypothetically they don't take a tackle and they take the best receiver on the board at five, then I think Trey Pipkins is probably still starting next year and then they'll probably take someone in round two, round three because I, I think round one is kind of where like the immediate – day one starters in this draft a tackle uh and and by the way you talked about ex-michigan players uh, we as we know they're just littered with offensive linemen in this yeah. year's draft so not necessarily guys that are going to go early but mm -hmm. guys that are going to be available late it'll be i mean you and, and you also know that any of these players that end up in free agency I mean, come on. I, I mean, I can't imagine how many guys, if they make it to free agency, aren't all going to just gravitate towards uh, the Chargers before anywhere else. Yeah. So, Yeah, uh, Trent Jones is one of those guys who's played tackle at uh, Michigan, so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they went after him. Zach Zinter is a guy who probably goes in like the middle of day three at guard um, after his injury last year, but I think you know uh, he's healing up and rehabbing uh, so far, so... I think those are kind of the linemen to look for. Uh, who else am I thinking of? Oh, Ladarius Henderson. Henderson. Yep. 
yeah, so those are probably like the day three guys, maybe if they don't uh, necessarily go tackle or if some of those guys, like you said, maybe uh, fall undrafted, then I think you could certainly see Harbaugh, yeah, picking them up in undrafted free agency. Uh, have you uh, used this like as a uh, contest yet? Like how many, like with the over and under on how many <laughs> Michigan players, how many rookies from Michigan end up on the roster? Have you done that yet? No, but I've been thinking of like betting odds in my head. And I'm like, because a month ago I was like, you know, I'll put the over under in one and a half and, and maybe. Oh, as, hell as, no. <laughs> uh, well, like as, as like. Well, wait a second. Before. We're not talking draft. We're talking draft or overall. Uh, if we're talking draft. overall, there's, oh yeah, draft, that's good. Draft yeah, is okay. I was like over, you know, a month ago I was thinking over under one and a half. And then uh, I've been keeping up with the top 30 visits of people who've been at the Chargers facility. And it's it's Blake Corum, it's Junior Colson, it's, <laughs> uh, you know, pretty much everyone they just met with uh, Chris Jenkins today, I think. So, you know, uh, <laughs> it, it's yeah. a, you know, who's who of names there. Uh, Roman Wilson, like uh, yeah. you mentioned earlier. Uh, could be that pit pick if they don't go wide receiver in round one. So, um, and maybe Cornelius say, Johnson becomes a free agent yeah. that comes in. Wide yeah, receiver. Cornelius Johnson. I think he's probably going to be the guy that gets drafted just because of how well could he be. tested in the combine. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I, I certainly think you go down the list, and there's probably going to be a whole litter of you know Michigan players probably on this roster. I don't think it's going to be you know four or five like Roman Wilson <laughs> said in his. Uh, in his quote, no, the other I don't day. think so. But no, I, I drafted, think, drafted. Yeah, I think I think you'll probably. My bet right now would be, if I had to say, I'd think two I from agree. from the draft. Yeah. I, I think you get one in that like rounds two to four range, whether that's a Mike Sainer still, Junior Colson, uh, Blake Corum, and then I think you'll get one maybe who is in that uh, day three range. So that could be um, a couple guys we mentioned already in, uh, as linemen. But then you also have A.J. Barner, tight end. You also have um, Jalen Harrell, who uh, is pretty good on the edge as well. Uh, so definitely a couple guys I could see them going there. But right now, my gut tells me two. I could certainly see that being three on that, on, on draft day. <laughs> and we're if they no, trade down and they all of a sudden go from nine to 12 picks, then maybe yeah. three. So right, exactly. Possible, <laughs> yeah. And what's that also uh, – and, and it could be other guys too, like Eric All. You know, ex Michigan players. Yeah, yeah. That he's Former well Michigan players. Of. Yep. Uh, I think I think Brock Bowers. That's another interesting one because he was another. I think he originally committed to Michigan and then flipped to flipped to Georgia. So there's definitely a couple guys who have been offered by Michigan. Uh, you know, yep. uh, plenty of guys that Harbaugh's done recruiting visits on and, and his homework <laughs> on that didn't even go maybe to Michigan, uh, for sure. Yeah, so it uh, should be interesting. And also for the next couple of years, this is not going to end because uh, he th th these are the years that they need to take advantage of his experience in college. Like you mm -hmm. said, recruiting these kids. He knows these kids that are coming out of the draft in the next couple of years. So three years from now, that's going to mm -hmm. change. But take advantage of these next two to three drafts. Yeah. I'm sure they're going to do that. Okay. Um, now at running back, you mentioned Gus Edwards. Makes a lot of sense. Baltimore, mm -hmm. Harbaugh's power running game. Okay, great. But right now, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I'm not a big Isaiah Spiller fan. <laughs> really have not been. Don't really consider that to be anything more than just he's still there. That's just me. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that there's no doubt that they've got to add a premium running back at some point. Now, look, this is the draft. That doesn't mean you can't get one of these guys in the third round, the fourth round, the fifth round, mm -hmm. uh, and still come in and be a big time contributor. So um, is there anyone specific, a type of player, uh, or, even, or again, a specific player that you think uh, might work best here besides Blake Corum? Yeah. Um, I'm a little lower on Blake Corum than the consensus. And I know a bunch of people want to put him in round two, round three. Oh, that's but too early. No. I, yeah. And, or, you know, you get to round four, but Blake Corum is, you know, 24. He's one of the older running backs in this class. Uh, he also did suffer the knee injury the year prior. Yep. And I, I wonder what part of Harbaugh kind of goes, man, you know, we we ran a lot of miles on that guy at Michigan, <laughs> right? Really and did. so the history of, you know, running back would suggest that, you know, and certainly the way that draft trends work is that age does have an inverse correlation with production. Um, so I am a little bit lower on Corum. I look at, uh, some of the guys like Jalen Wright, 
uh, in this class out of Tennessee. I think if you put him uh, in a backfield kind of with Gus Edwards, maybe as your power back, I think Jalen Wright is a great instant contributor and also change a pace back because they don't really have a running back with uh, a lot of you know home run speed who okay. also uh, has that vision in between tackles that Jalen Wright does. Um, so I look at him. I think if you're going more for that like physical downhill nature, certainly a guy uh, like Braylon Allen makes a lot of sense uh, in a Greg Roman type of run game out of Wisconsin. Uh, I know Jordan Reed uh, from ESPN mentioned that uh, on my show. Uh, it, he's you know potentially a perfect uh, you know fit. Uh, a lot of different contrasting styles, I think, of running backs in this class. You have your more physical guys. Um, certainly more of your like speedster types as well, like right, who I just mentioned. So a um, lot of interesting possibilities, but I think if we're talking like of the top of the running backs that are going to go in the top 100, I think Jalen Wright would be like kind of my favorite fit in that round three range. Yeah. And he's actually right now our lads uh, number two running back out of the entire yeah. class. Yeah. That, that, you know, it's kind of interesting because there's not like a true consensus number no. one right now. Uh, I, a lot of people value Brooks, but then there's obviously the questions about the knee injury from last year. Um, and so then you have like Trey Benson, who is my personal uh, oh, yeah. RB. I, I like Trey Benson a lot. He's my oh, personal yeah. RB1 when I scout these guys and I watch the tape. So um, I, I would rank him as my favorite, but I think he might go a little too early before the Chargers in round three. Because uh, I think I think that run at running backs that's going to happen in the draft really starts after 50. I think you're going to start to see those running back picks come off the board fast with maybe like six, seven uh, that come in that period from yeah. 50 to pick 100. I think you're going to see them start to fly off the board, even though this has kind of been like a, a panned running back class by a lot of people. And like, oh, it's not that good, you know, and that's why maybe Saquon Barkley and some of these other bigger free agents kind of got more favorable uh contracts but i still do think this is a running back class where you can get some of those absolutely uh, years, day three guys even though it is a little bit of an older group a little bit more injured but i still think i do think the chargers probably take one with especially considering that extra fourth round pick that they have from the keenan allen trade i would bet on one of their first five selections certainly to be used on a running back before yeah at, at pick 110 is kind of the lower end of the picks there um, but I would definitely think that they take one. Yeah, I think they're, I think most of the criticism comes because there isn't the top 10 running back in this class. Mm. So they yeah. pan it when th that doesn't make a running back class. What makes the running back right. class is the depth. And, and it does have good quality depth. Like you said, there's a bunch of, I was talking to Dave Seibert's in our lead scout at our lads. And he, matter of fact, has Benson as his number one. And mm -hmm. he talked about how once you get past Benson, he goes, my number two and my seven, there's like, basically you can, you can swap them. That's how close yeah. they are uh, as far as how he grades them. So I, exactly what you're saying. So, yeah, I think there's definitely going to be more than enough running backs to choose from once you get past the first and probably even the second, but like you said, somewhere in the middle of that second round, uh, once it starts, uh, once they start coming off the clock. Okay. Um, uh, by the way, uh, Ben Mason is an interesting pickup, and I know he might just be, well, again, he was on the practice squad, Harbaugh, and we need a fullback. Let's see. But I remember when he came out, he just had so – he was like a – he was. I, I, I remember saying, oh, he's got Baltimore Ravens written all over him. And so he actually went to the Ravens. I know he hasn't mm -hmm. done anything yet, but right. um, I still think that, you know, he's a no-name right now, but he's an intriguing player, and I know nobody, nobody uses fullbacks very often anymore. But um, I just thought that was very interesting that I just remember him coming out of college, thought he was the perfect fit for what the Ravens wanted to do. And now that's definitely the same uh, that holds true for the Chargers. So um, I'm intrigued to see if uh, this kid uh, actually sticks. Yeah, I, th I think if there's two teams that you're trying to make a roster spot uh, as, as a fullback, the two <laughs> most difficult teams are probably the Niners and the Ravens with uh, yeah. use check. Uh, in, in San Francisco and then uh, Pat Ricard in, in Baltimore. So that's ultimately why there wasn't a role for, for Ben Mason to play on that yeah. team with the amount of roster spots. But, you know, he's, he's an intriguing pickup. Um, I know the Chargers tight ends coach talked last week that they kind of view him as uh, what they call an F, which is a you know hybrid between tight end and fullback. Um, so, you know, I'll kind of be curious to see his usage throughout training camp, throughout the preseason, um, and see – 
how they want to utilize them. And I think they've also used kind of that F terminology and how they like look at how the Ravens look at Isaiah likely sort of as like the hybrid uh, kind of player as well. So I, th I think Ben Mason is somebody that can certainly make the roster if they end up utilizing the fullbacks in Greg Roman's offense. Um, it just depends, I think, on how they fill out the rest of the roster. And then they obviously have Donald Parham and Stone Smart still competing for uh, spots at tight end. Uh, and are they going to take a tight end in this draft? And then so, <laughs> certainly, then oh, yeah. will, you know, yeah. Dis Disley and Hurst, I think, are roster locks. And then after that, if you throw a tight end in there, um, it, it would make uh, that fourth spot, if there is going to be a fourth That's tight true. end slash fullback spot on the roster, pretty pretty competitive, I think, between uh, Parham, Smart, Mason, and you know, if they do draft a tight end, uh, whoever that player is. Uh from what you've seen out of, by the way, before we move on to the defense, from what you've seen out of uh, that quarterback room, Stick been getting chances to play uh, finally. Mm -hmm. But do you think Stick is a? Do you think Harbaugh? I don't know if we've talked about him yet, but do they envision him as a quality number two? Um, you know, I, I think the way that they've viewed Stick is just he's been in the quarterback room with Herbert for a while. Uh, I think they're comfortable with him playing that, and I think the reality is like. Herbert goes down like you're kind of you're kind of done anyway right um, but stick is someone who got valuable reps towards the end of the season I don't know if I foresee them making like a premium quarterback investment oh yeah um, maybe there could be like a day three pick but I don't even think this is the draft to do that again with the amount of needs that they have on this roster they drafted um, Max Duggan at a TCU last year who as we see is still on this roster um, who maybe has some future QB2 potential, but I, I think Stick holding that job for as long as he has is a credit to, you know, his performance under, you know, circumstances of last year, which was a team, you know, unfortunately going, you know, right down the gutter. He, he played some quality games, I think, for what it's worth at the end of it. Um, and I think him and Justin have always kind of had that connection in the quarterback room. So I think that's why he's, he's stuck around for a while. Um, as you see, he's drafted yeah. in 2019. He's been in a quarterback room with Philip Rivers, with Tyrod Taylor, with Justin Herbert, uh, really everyone. Um, so I think that's a testament to uh, what what he does as kind of a, you know, uh, someone who's vocal in the quarterback room and then also can step in there if need be. All right, let's uh, move on to defense. And uh, the one spot that I actually uh, thought they would lean towards first on defense was kind of where you went with your number three overall need mm -hmm. on our other video. Um, and that was uh, the defensive line um, yeah. because yeah, they added Puna Ford, but other than that, there's just not a lot of uh, matter of fact, there really isn't any wow players on the defensive mm -hmm. line. And so that has to change. So um, which players do you think are part of the future? Um, if anybody, that's an interesting question. I, I think they they like what Otito Bonia has shown at points, but obviously he just came back from a pretty devastating knee injury last year. So we really haven't gotten to um, see him kind of in this defense. Um, outside of that, they drafted Scott Matlock last year, but as you said, like a lot of the previous draft class, you know, members as part of this new regime, like who knows who's going to stick and who won't. Um, Chris Hinton does have the the Michigan uh, connection, he which does that. I, I, I do think is kind of interesting. And he's he's played um, he, he's played some pretty significant snaps with the Chargers over the last uh, two years. You know, as they, as they weathered a lot of uh, defensive tackle injuries, and then Puna Ford, I think, is a big question mark. Um, you know, obviously the guy from Seattle a couple of years ago who was really solid for that. Yeah. defensive line but it's been a few years since he's been kind of in that form and then uh, unfortunately didn't get a lot of playing time in buffalo so i think this is kind of a prove it year for him uh so to speak and i think he's happy to take this opportunity with the chargers so i hope that works out um but yeah they they really just need that premium pass rusher i think somewhere in those first four rounds uh in particular and this is the class to do that obviously we mentioned Chris Jenkins, but there's there's a number of guys I think in that four round range uh, who could you know be instant contributors uh, for the Chargers. And so, and that means that, and in, th in this draft, would you think that it's uh, more likely 
or um, a question whether or not they add two pieces, one being just you know regular defensive lineman for their base, another being maybe a nose tackle. Do you think that's more than likely or um, or you know a big question uh, too? Yeah, I would say less likely only because I think I think the position if they, if there is one that they double dip on uh, might actually be corner. Um, I think this is a really talented uh, cornerback group. And I think you can get some guys who, you know, if you make that round two pick a corner or even if they trade back for a corner round one, you have one there. And then, you know, round four, round five rolls along. I still think there's some playable guys in that range. Uh, defensive tackle, I think, certainly is like a possibility. Um, but if I had to bet on one, I think it probably would be corner because right now, okay. like you see on the – Depth chart, um, they have John Taylor in the slot, who was all right. Um, Asante Samuel Jr. in the last year of his rookie contract. Uh, and then they have Christian Fulton from Tennessee, who's kind of a you know buy low candidate to see if they can turn him into something uh, in this Jesse Venter scheme. But certainly there's nothing kind of guaranteed there. Um, and I think you look at how set you know the safety room is with Derwin James and Olympi Gilman. Um, and the edge room with Joey Bosa and, and Khalil Mack this year. Uh, I, I think that corner is kind of the one that sticks out to me more, but I do still think defensive tackle. Yeah. They, they definitely have to get some bodies in there, whether that's, you know, one in the draft, maybe one in uh, free agency post draft and then undrafted free agency. I definitely think they'll find out a way to kind of fill that room. Is the most important thing in the secondary to find a nickel corner more than anything? Uh, nickel corner, but also, I mean, outside, <laughs> like, I, I think they need an outside long-term corner there too. Um, which is why you I, think they're going to have multiple picks. Yeah. You're going to have to have an outside I, yeah. guy and, and it's but right. Fulton. Do you look at, if they did that is Fulton then used more, all right, we'll go to camp. We've got our outside mm -hmm. young pick and we've got Fulton and we're going to let them compete and go from there. And then the other guy we draft is more than likely going to end up starting ahead of Taylor. Yeah, probably. Um, I think, for example, if, if they were to do the trade back scenario and, and let's say they wind up with um, one of the Alabama corners, right? They got Terry on Arnold and, and Kool-Aid McKinstry there, Cooper DeGene, right? If they can wind up with that type of corner in a round one trade back, let's say with the Vikings, then I think you're looking at that player, you know, playing outside, um, maybe with Asante Samuel Jr. And they can kind of, you know, have Fulton kind of compete. Um but yeah, I think it really depends on how many corners they take. But I think if you get that outside corner in the early rounds, then um, depending on which round they're taking, then they'll compete with Fulton. But if, you, if they take a corner, I think in the first two rounds, then that player is an automatic starter. I actually think if there's one Michigan player that I can see Harbaugh, like if he had like a, a list, a board, all right, here's my preference of the guys, all my Michigan guys, and, and preference mm -hmm. of who I want. I think who might be at the top might be Sandra still. I really yeah. do. I, I would, you know, I think we've seen the value of slot corner uh, increase around the league uh, in, in recent years, and Sandra still is a lockdown guy. Um, from that position, he would be an immediate day one starter. Um, you know, the the only the only thing is, I really think it comes down to how much they value having an outside corner uh, sure. in particular and like someone who can play both because Sanger still obviously is, is really good at what he does in the slot, but obviously with the size concerns, he's not a guy that is going to play outside in the league, but I, I love him as a prospect and you get him in round two. I think yep. that makes uh, a whole lot of sense uh, for the way this defense can run. And ultimately, uh, you know, I thought about this also with um, junior Colson, a uh, potential linebacker candidate, they need someone who is going to be the green dot defensive play caller. Uh, and I think if they take one of those Michigan guys, then that player has kind of that instant chemistry uh, with Minter uh, can do a lot there and, you know, potentially is the signal caller uh, for the defense. So I think that's something to watch here. Um, Derwin James obviously has called the plays in the past, um, but Minter kind of spoke about not wanting to like overwhelm him with you okay. know responsibility. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if one of those Michigan guys they drafted, particularly Colson, uh, if he were to end up being the pick, winds up being the signal caller for the Chargers on defense. Interesting. Okay. So uh, before we move over to linebacker to wrap up there, 
the uh, Gilman, where did he come from? I mean, he really, were you surprised about the breakout or did you see that coming? He's a guy that I think for a couple of years has just, you know, been really, really smart at playing in the right positions. He's come around with a few critical turnovers that, you know, earlier on in his career, 21, 22, actually won the Chargers some games. Um, and then I think last year was just a, a buildup of the work he's done, uh, certainly it, from previous seasons. And I think you really saw him uh, take off from there, particularly just his, his instincts uh, and how he approaches, you know, coverages. Uh, particularly when he's playing kind of in that free safety role, um, I, I think have just gone, you know, kind of through the roof. Um, and that's ultimately why he got the contract that he did. And when you have a young safety like that, I think even, I, I think it speaks to the kind of season that Gilman had that this new regime came in here, you know, no real previous connection to Gilman. And he earned that uh, two year, $10 million deal. Uh, for the team. So I think that uh, speaks to how much they wanted to keep him around, uh, how uh, maybe desired he was throughout the league uh, in free agency uh, with, with the season he had. And so uh, I think they made the right decision to okay. keep him around. Uh, what about uh, Samuel and James uh, specific, uh, maybe more so of course, James, because he's older, but um are these guys, do you, do you expect them to be around for a while? I mean, Sam was going to get a new deal, right? Yeah, yeah I I, mm, I don't know. I, I think it would be interesting to see whether he gets a new deal or not. Okay. Um, only because I wonder whether he's like the ideal mentor system, you know, corner. Um, and I think towards the end of last season, he had certainly some, some rough games, but the whole defense did as a whole. Um, I would be curious to see again, and this kind of depends on the type of corner they draft, whether Asante Samuel Jr. is a part of their future. Um, so I, I think about that and okay. potentially letting him walk for comp picks, uh, which is something Joe Hortiz is big on. Um, and I, you know, there's just, there's no way of knowing until we see, I guess, how the season plays out. Um, but he's certainly going to be a starter this year and I think has a chance to earn a contract extension. But they also, you know, have to worry about what they're going to do in free agency next year. Uh, prioritizing, you know, player like Rashawn Slater as well, um, you know, in terms of a contract extension. So I would say I don't think he gets one right now, but I think that is something that could change uh, throughout the season. And, and Derwin, as you mentioned, I think is a guy who is going to be around for a long time. He just signed a contract extension two years ago. Uh, I can't remember, but he, you know, became the highest paid safety in the league. Uh, I, Parbaugh has talked ad nauseum about, you know, him and, and, you know, there's not many safeties like him in the league sure, and sure. has talked about him in that way too. Uh, and I think Jesse Minter will certainly love to, to use him. So I see Derwin James, like I said, I think there's three players that definitely have roles on this team within the next two or three years. And that's, that's Herbert. I think that's Slater. And I think that's Derwin James as well. Okay. And, uh, are there any of those other DBs? You got Wilcox, Findlay, Leonard, Hankins, and the highest drafted JT Woods. Any of those guys that you think could you know, be part of the future, could be ready to you know take the next step? JT Woods is interesting uh, only because, I mean, he had a really high athletic profile coming out of college, um, but, you know, he just hasn't gotten a chance to really – play significant snaps, particularly in year one, was behind Alohi and Derwin. Uh, and then in year two, he dealt uh, with a lot of health issues, uh, was kind of off the field really uh, pretty much the last three quarters of the season. Oh, okay. um, and so I don't really know what the future holds for, for Woods. Uh, in general, it was never like totally disclosed kind of what um, he was dealing with. But I think that... Uh, it'll be interesting to see kind of what this new staff, if they see something in him, uh, just because coming out of Baylor, he did have a lot of those, you know, project safety type traits. You know, we talked about kind of him needing to work on tackling, but the the speed, the instincts uh, were certainly there for somebody who could be a weapon at the safety position. So um, I'm not necessarily like betting on a breakout, but if there's a guy who I think is a little bit interesting, I, I certainly think it could be JT Woods. Were they actually thinking when when he drafted him so high? Was the thought at that point that he was going to be the starting free safety, and then all of a sudden Gilman started to up his game? 
Um, I think when he was drafted, they always viewed him as a little bit of a project, but I think the previous regime uh, – always bet on some of those guys who had those like athletic traits okay. uh, in particular. I don't know. If, I, I don't think they expected Gilman to quite develop the way he did. Um, certainly at the time that they made that pick back in 2022. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, uh, yeah, Woods was certainly supposed to be um, kind of a, a, a real like Staley uh, safety where, you know, I, I think the, the ultimate vision was probably him playing with, Derwin and, and getting to work on those traits, but obviously with um, Tom Telesco and Brandon Staley fired, they never really got to work with him the way that I think they ultimately wanted to. And that obviously coincides with, you know, his, his uh, health battles, uh, you know, last year to try to stay on the field. So uh, I think that that, you know, was just kind of an incomplete project right now, but we'll see whether Harbaugh, um, Minter, I think there's some overlap uh, from safeties coach uh, Chris O'Leary, who was also a Notre Dame side. Uh, sorry, no. Now I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Gilman. Uh, I don't think there's really anyone who's. Uh, I was uh, yeah, thinking of Gilman, but there's no one it's who's overlap. Yeah, it's <laughs> kind of sad. There's no one who really overlaps with JT Woods on the coaching staff. Um, okay. But I would just be curious if they view him as kind of a athletic weapon. Hey. Maybe there's some potential there, but I, I think Derwin and, Derwin and Gilman is certainly the future right now. All right. And uh, wrapping up uh, at linebacker. So you, you mentioned uh, the fact that maybe keep an eye on someone coming in there, uh, especially Colson. Um, but you take a look and they added a couple of guys, Perryman, the most notable. Um, uh, Henley mm-hmm. being a third round pick last year, again, new coaching staff and all that. But I would think that when you draft a guy in the third round, the idea was, was he was going to be a big time part of their defense this year. Do you still think that's possible? Yeah, I, I think right now he's, he's pegged in to be a uh, starter uh, along with Denzel Perriman. Those would be the two okay. um, as we, you know, enter the draft, we'll see what happens. But uh, I think the goal for him last year, cause he's actually a, a safety that was converted to linebacker. So again, he was kind of a, a project pick a little bit of the old regime um, but you know, he played for, uh, Ryan Fickens, uh, special teams last year, Ryan Fickens still here from the old staff, uh, still as the special teams coordinator. So I think there's, you know, he's still pretty high on Dion. And I think, um, Dion actually has a lot of coverage instincts that I think that, you know, an older linebacker like Denzel Perriman, who's more of a, uh, hit stick artist, <laughs> he's more of a, you know, just, you know, run to the ball, run defender, um, I think he can make up for some of his deficiencies in coverage. So that's why I, I kind of look towards somebody like Junior Colson, who actually, you know, is one of the higher uh, graded linebackers in coverage in this class. And I think they maybe want to add that to kind of uh, certainly offset Perriman a little bit, who I think is still a really, you know, quality NFL starter, um, but I think is going to have his struggles certainly in coverage. So I think Dion and whichever linebacker that they – uh, taking the draft would certainly contribute towards uh, offsetting some of those, you know, deficiencies of having, you know, an older starting linebacker. Okay. And then at edge, uh, of course, there's Bosa and Mac. Can't get much better than that. But fact is, is these guys aren't getting any younger, especially mm-hmm. Mac. It's amazing that he was so productive last year. It's one yeah. of those things that you just, as a fan, you're like, man, did you have to waste such a great year right. last year, especially at his age. But you've got to keep your fingers crossed that he's got a couple more years left. But um, we know how good they are. But the question then becomes the depth. And mm-hmm. besides those two, do they? what does the future look like uh, from their second-round pick last year, who statistically did not do that bad uh, for yeah. rookies? Yeah, they, they loved what Thule brought last year, and I think he certainly stepped up, um, particularly in some games early in the season when uh, Joey Bosa, you know, wasn't on the field. And, you know, they I think there's a stat that Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, and Thule, uh, Thule Pelotu were on the field for 40 plays last season, which wow. kind of just, you know, comments uh, on, you know, unfortunately Bosa being unable to stay healthy last year. But on those 40 plays, uh, the Chargers recorded 10 sacks. You know, so I, I think there is, you know, wow. a very a very small sample size, um, okay. but you know they they got you know some pretty serious pass rush pressures when you know all three of those guys were on the field, uh, you know either having Tule on the edge or kicking Bosa inside, 
Uh, so there's a lot of different maneuvers that they can kind of do there. Um, and so I think Thule is definitely part of the future. Um, Bosa and Mac are on these one year pay cut deals that they renegotiated to be able to come back um, before they ended up trading Keenan Allen. So they decided to keep those two uh, out of the big four restructures of Mike Williams, Keenan Allen, uh, and then those two. So they ended up keeping those for Jesse Minter's uh, defense. So uh, I think they're, you know, very valued there in terms of what they'll bring to the team this year. And depending on how many years that, like you mentioned, they have producing at a high level, um, then I, I think they their futures for the team are a little bit uh, tenuous based on that and, and how long they can stay healthy and does the new regime want to bring in any guys. Um, yeah. But I certainly think Thule is part of that future. And I think Bosa and Mac are kind of on a Chargers basis playing a little bit year to year now, depending on uh, what the new regime kind of wants to go for. So it, it also wouldn't surprise me. And, you know, you mentioned this with tackle that Trey Pipkins is not going to be, uh, I guess, a, a block towards them taking yeah. a tackle. It's not like, okay, we're paying him $9 million. So that means we can't draft the tackle. And I kind of view edge a little bit the same way. I don't think they're going to make a first round premium investment and in a guy like Dallas Turner or anything like that. Um, but I do see them, at some point in this draft, if the value is right, maybe fourth, fifth round, I think they could take an edge because I, I think this is a team that, you know, may not have Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack next year, uh, depending on how the chips fall for their 2024 seasons. Uh, and Tuli is really the only player who is locked in here long term uh, for the next, you know, uh, two years after this one. Okay. So I would say. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if they draft an edge maybe a little earlier than people anticipate, only because I think that, like you mentioned with tackle, this is not yeah. a draft that they're viewing like, you know, kind of almost in a Jets way of like, we have to compete this year. I think True. with the job security of being a new GM and having Harbaugh here as coach, um, I think Joe Ortiz will exercise a little bit of thinking two, three years down the road yeah. uh, with some of these picks as well. All right. And then uh, how did the uh, special teams fare uh, for the uh, program last year? Yeah. Uh, Ryan Ficken, who came in two years ago uh, as special teams coordinator, he's had top 10 special teams uh, both years. Uh, and special teams for the Chargers was for a long time uh, pretty, pretty maligned uh, before they kind of got their stuff together. And uh, Ryan Ficken is the only member of the previous coaching staff who uh, is on this new Harbaugh coaching staff in the same role as special teams coordinator. So I think that speaks to, uh, again, you know, how much they value him and, and what he's done for that, you know, whole group of uh, guys and core special teamers uh, that they have there. And he's sort of, you know, really revitalized the Chargers special teams. And as the new special teams rules change with the new kickoff and things like that, I think they trust uh, Ryan Ficken, Darius Davis, who was their draft pick at a TCU last year, who was their kick returner, punt returner. Um, Cameron Dicker was one of the most accurate kickers in the league last season. Uh, so I, I think they're happy to keep that structure in place uh, right now. Yeah. Uh, do, they, do they need a punter or are they satisfied there as well? Uh, I think right now they're scheduled. They're, they're, they like what they get out of J.K. Scott. And uh, we'll see maybe if there's a guy that comes in and like undrafted free agency. I wouldn't be shocked if they had like a competition or something like that. But ultimately, I think J.K. Scott – and that special teams group with uh, him, Josh Harris, their long snapper, Darius Davis, their returner, and Cameron Dicker, I think that group uh, kind of stays intact. But I, I do give a lot of credit to, to Ficken, who is the coordinator there. There was a lot of rumors, you know, when they were kind of in negotiations with Harbaugh about uh, Jay Harbaugh, his son, uh, who was the special teams coordinator in Michigan, potentially coming over. So I think almost, um, you know, not that he yeah, picked sure. up his own son, but it, you know, it does speak to the a lot of the work that he did. And then Jay That's Harbaugh, right. Jay Harbaugh ended up going to Seattle. He's the special teams coordinator with the Seahawks now. Um, but yeah, I think uh, I think special teams is probably the most set part of the team, which is awesome. But that's not how you become a contender in the NFL. <laughs> Obviously, they have a lot of moves to make on offense and defense. Uh, by the way, is there going to be anybody that you would see that may be back as far as the uh, UFAs? Uh, out of the current like list right now, I'm trying to yep. trying to think. I mean, the the uh, names that uh, Josh Kelly is he going to be back? I don't think so. 
No. Okay. Yeah. Most of no. his names don't really. Uh... Yeah. I think they, when they brought Gilman back, um, that was really the one that was kind of the debatable one. They let Michael Davis and Austin Eckler walk to, to Washington. So um, no, not really any high profile like names. Maybe, maybe if there's like a injury or something and they have you know, previous connections with, you know, one of these players, I could see that happening. Um, okay. But right now, I think they're pretty moved on and settled for current free agency. Uh, I know that they had, in terms of free agency, some interest in some of the wide receivers. So this will kind of depend on um, what they do in the draft coming up. But they were interested, I think, in Tyler Boyd, who's still a free agent. Marcus okay. Valdez-Scanley is still a free agent uh, as well. Um, so I think, depending on how the draft goes, you know, you mentioned there's a possibility they take one, take two receivers, depending on how things play out. Uh, I think if maybe they only take one, then they could certainly call a couple guys who are still free agents, including the two I mentioned. Odell, Odell Beckham Jr. is still available. Um, so there's certainly a couple names that they could do there. But I would look at, you know, wide receiver. There's still a lot of, you know, premium talent out there actually uh, in this free agent market, guys that haven't gotten deals yet. So I think a lot of them waiting till after the draft now to see which teams still need to fill some holes. And cap space is okay? No problem? Picking someone up? Yeah, yeah. Um, they've, you know, the Keenan Allen trade, as, as unexpected as it was, kind of fixed a lot of their cap issues for, for the time being. And then they open up, they open up a lot of cap room next season. But certainly if they wanted to sign a guy to a, you know, uh, somewhere between like a three, seven million dollar deal, like that's not something that's going to concern them based on their, you know, uh, current cap situation. So I, I think cool. that they're going to be a team, uh, you know, after the draft, depending on what holes they still have, can certainly still make some moves. All right, Alex, give me your prediction. Are they going to trade their pick or are they going to keep their pick and draft? Let's say Harrison's gone. Who? What do you think they do? Mm -hmm. They draft or they okay. trade out? What's, what's your what's your what are you leaning towards right now? Well, if you're if you're giving me the situation that Harrison's gone to the Cardinals, then I think the Chargers will trade out. Okay. Um, that if, if that is how the board ends up playing out, I think they'll trade out uh, to maybe 11 with the Vikings, um, six with the Giants is another possibility uh, that would keep them high on the board. I know there's been uh, Peter Schrager had his mock draft this morning, but he had the Giants trading up with the Cardinals uh, to go get one of the quarterbacks in, in, in uh, McCarthy, I think. So um, that, you know, really, I think there are two scenarios. I think, I think if the Cardinals make the trade at four, uh, for the quarterback, then I think the Chargers will stick at five uh, and pick Marvin Harrison Jr. I think if they if the Cardinals pick Marvin Harrison Jr., then the Chargers will trade out trade, uh, yeah. to, to to eleven or to whatever team. Uh, them the better deal, there. or yeah, <laughs> gives them a better deal between the Giants, Vikings, and some of the other teams that are going to be fighting for quarterbacks. Yeah. Because if the Vikings, uh, if they trade down to the Vikings, they better give them a better deal because they're going to be moving yeah. down what five extra, six extra spots, well, five extra spots. Right. So yeah, yeah, it's got to be, it's gotta be my favorite. Thing. My favorite scenario is getting Marvin Harrison Jr. That's of course. <laughs> it, I, yeah. yeah. I think if the Cardinals, if the Cardinals trade out, I think that is what the Chargers will do. Um, and then you know the backup is obviously you can get two first round picks potentially from a team like the Vikings for that spot um, yep. that could trade up. So I think really the Chargers can't lose this draft um i think i think they do uh they will make out with either a blue chip premium wide receiver in the first round or you know establish kind of the hardball you know ground game and then get another first round prospect later in the draft so uh those are kind of the options so kind yeah. of a can't lose situation obviously say that going into the draft and we'll look back in two years and uh, <laughs> yeah, sure of course completely different depending well. on you know what actually happens but you know right now i i think they're in a very uh, advantageous position. Yeah. I, I, and again, because like I said before, because Harbaugh knows these, these kids that he's recruited for that are still going to be around for two or three years mm -hmm. pre as they can just build as many of those picks as possible. So he can get his hands on m as many of those players as possible. Then I, that's what I see happening. So I, I agree. I, I think they're going to wind up trading down because I do think Arizona is going to take Harrison um but we'll see should be a lot of fun and you're going to be talking about it on uh the guilty as charged podcast your show is both breakdowns and how often do you do the show yeah i do the show once a week um we on the channel are going to be having a live stream uh event of the draft i think all three days so i'll be on there for uh, some of that uh you know so <laughs> we'll see what happens with the pick or if they decide to trade down 
Uh, so, you know, check out that live stream Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, I think we'll be uh, doing that stuff. And I'll be doing, you know, my videos once a week throughout the throughout the offseason, certainly after the draft as well, you know, reacting to each of their picks, uh, keep up with my work on Chargers Wire as well. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun stuff coming up in the next uh, two weeks. When do you record or post the show? Uh, I, I don't have a set day every week. Oh, anytime. On, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Once a week. Just once uh, a week. Depends, depends on other people's schedules if I have them on the show. So, you know, you know. That's so great is. about it's not radio. So that's, yeah. that's, a good, that's a great thing about podcasting. Just yeah, you know, how to to kind of schedule interviews and, <laughs> and get people to do it and hunt them down. And so <laughs> I, I know the feeling. All right, Alex. Uh, thank you. Great job filling us in with what's going on with the Chargers. Should be a lot of fun following the organization with Jim Harbaugh there. I'm sure the fan base is ecstatic. Uh, they've got the coach, they've got the quarterback, and now they just got to go ahead and uh, watch it all unfold. So um, uh, appreciate it. And I hope we can do this again some other time, uh, especially right after the draft. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. And I'd be happy to come on again. You got it. Take care, Alex. Thanks.